Um, the talk is more or less what it says here on the slide. Hopefully you can all see the slide. Going from quantum mechanics to space time. And the thing that is going to be a little bit different here is that everyone gives talks on you know quantum gravity, right? Especially in a seminar series like this. But I think that there is a tendency, as we'll talk about, to start with a classical notion of what you mean by space time and then try to quantize it. And here we're really going to try to be purists or extremists or fundamentalists, if you want to put it that way, going from a quantum mechanical description that does not already have space time built into it and finding space time within the quantum state. That's going to be the difficult thing to do. So if you uh, have taken a quantum mechanics class, you're taught how to invent a quantum mechanical theory. And it's maybe not said in exactly these words, but you start with some classical precursor theory. So let's say you have a non-relativistic particle in one dimension. You have a Hamiltonian, right? H, P squared over 2M, that's the momentum. And then there's a potential. And then you're taught a set of rules for how to take this classical theory and quantize it to develop a quantum mechanical theory on that basis. Uh, there's more than one way to do this. One way, uh, this is one of the first ones you will learn, is to build wave functions out of the classical variables. So you take one of the variables, either the coordinate or the momentum, not both, uh, and you invent complex valued functions of that variable. So psi is a function of x, the coordinate. And then you say it's normalizable, square integrable, right? And then it obeys the Schrodinger equation where the Hamiltonian that you had in the classical theory is upgraded to an operator on this space of all possible wave functions. For example, by converting the momentum into a differential operator and X is just multiplication. So now you have this classical theory and there's a map from the space of classical theories to the space of quantum theories. Now, I won't get into this very much, but the map from quantum theories, from classical theories to quantum theories is neither one-to-one -one nor onto, okay? You can get multiple quantum theories from one classical theory. You can get a single quantum theory from multiple classical theories. So it's not a very well-defined map, but we gloss over that when you're taught quantum mechanics to start out. Um, so what I want to point out is, and you know, you all, you all know this, that what you get out of that recipe is a set of vectors, okay? You notice, or if you're John von Neumann, you notice that these functions you can talk about as an element of a Hilbert space, a certain complex normed vector space, because you can add them, right? You can add functions together and you can scale them by complex numbers. And there is a norm, so there's an inner product on the space of all uh, of these vectors. And for many times, the vector space is infinite dimensional, but sometimes it's finite dimensional. So either, either case uh, is of physical interest. And so if you ask me, what is your quantum theory, right? What is the quantum mechanical theory that you've given me? Uh, the information you're asking for is what is the dimensionality of the Hilbert space on which you're acting? And then what is the Hamiltonian? If you, if you, if you take it as given that the Schrodinger equation is obeyed, we're putting aside quantum measurements for now. I'm an Everettian, so I, I can always put those aside, but some of you might care about that. But in the Everettian point of view anyway, all you need is that Hamiltonian right there. You have the Schrodinger equation, you're done. That's the entire content of your quantum mechanical theory, the dimensionality of H and what is the Hamiltonian. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, uh, when, I, when I was taking quantum mechanics, I was told you need to tell me what the observables are your th of your theory are. So we know that observables in quantum mechanics are represented by self-adjoint operators, okay? Operators that map Hilbert space to itself. So you give me a quantum state, I operate on it, I get another state back. There's self-adjoint, which is just this condition on acting in the different sides of the uh, inner product. And in simple finite dimensional cases, that means they're Hermitian operators, okay? And yes, indeed, you could pick different choices of what your operators are. They would be uh, specified by an algebra of observables, okay? So there's a, a bilinear form on the space of operators, the, the uh, commutator, basically. And the commutator of any two operators is uh, some linear combination of other operators. That's what it means to be an algebra. So you might think that I haven't really defined a quantum mechanical theory until I've told you what the operators are. But if you dig into it a little bit more carefully, uh, if the dimensionality of Hilbert space is infinitely big, then indeed different sets of observables on what looks like the same Hilbert space actually do define different quantum theories, okay? So you have to be very careful when Hilbert space is infinite dimensional 
about saying exactly what are the observables in your theory. This is a relevant worry, for example, when you're doing quantum field theory and you go from the free theory to the interacting theory, suddenly you're in a different Hilbert space. So this is a very, very down to earth practical worry in some cases. But in other cases, when the dimensionality of Hilbert space is finite, the space of observables is just the space of all Hermitian operators. You do not need to specify anything specific about which observables you care about, which observables you're allowed to use in your quantum theory, because it's all of them. It's all the Hermitian operators if the dimensionality of Hilbert space is finite, okay? Any Hermitian operator is self-adjoint. They all define good observables. So you might think, well, that's fine as a little curiosity, but we know that Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. You know, for a single non-relativistic particle, Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. Surely for quantum field theory, Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. True, but we're, we care about gravity now. And gravity actually makes things interesting in a way that makes them both harder in some ways, easier in other ways. In quantum field theory, it is true that the dimensionality of Hilbert space is infinite. And it's interesting to think about why it's infinite. You might think, well, I have modes of my quantum field, they have different wavelengths, any different wavelength is allowed. If I, if I don't include gravity as a cutoff, then I have no Planck scale cutoff or anything like that. Even if I put my theory in a box, so it's an infrared cutoff, there's no UV cutoff. So I just go down to arbitrary wavelengths. So I get an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. But let's say you do have an ultraviolet cutoff. Let's say you put the theory on a lattice or something like that. Okay. So you have both a UV and an IR cutoff. The dimensionality of Hilbert space is still infinite dimensional in quantum field theory, even in a cutoff quantum field theory, because every individual mode acts like a simple harmonic oscillator. And a single simple harmonic oscillator has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. You can put as much energy into it as you want. Here is the picture of all the different states, all different energy eigenstates of the simple harmonic oscillator, okay? So the reason why quantum field theory has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space isn't because of the lack of a UV cutoff. It's for every mode, you can put as much energy in as you want. But gravity provides a cutoff in that sense. Gravity says, no, no, no. You cannot put an infinite amount of energy in every mode of your quantum field theory. If you tried to do that, you would make a black hole. This is related to what is called the Bekenstein bound. There's only a finite number of things you can do in a region of space before you make a black hole. And that's reflected in the fact that the black hole has a finite entropy and it's a maximum entropy state. So there's only a finite dimensional Hilbert space that describes what can possibly happen physically in any given region of space, okay? Not because there's a lattice or anything like that, but just because of this non-local feature of gravity, there's only so much energy that you can have in a region. So what we believe is true in quantum gravity that is not true in quantum field theory is that to the extent that you're in a semi-classical approximation and can just look at some region of space, that region of space is described by a finite dimensional Hilbert space. It is radically different from quantum field theory. And I think this is the most basic fact we know about quantum gravity. And it's one that is often not put front and center as something we should care about. So I'm putting it front and center. I think it's something we should care about. If we take this attitude that we're building up space time from the fundamental quantum description, the fact that that fundamental quantum description is finite dimensional in Hilbert space is the most important fact that we know. And what it means is that in fact, you don't need to be given the algebra of observables to de define your quantum gravity theory because you only have a finite dimensional Hilbert space to act them on. Your algebra of observables is every Hermitian operator, okay? At least when you talk about some finite region of space, let's say our observable horizon, right? Outside, maybe there's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, but our subsystem, our factor of Hilbert space is finite dimensional. And what that means is, uh, if you want to do this program of saying, well, how do you give me the information defining your quantum mechanical theory? It's a very small amount of information, right? In the, again, in the Everettian philosophy anyway, the universe is a vector in Hilbert space. It obeys the Schrodinger equation. That's it. That is the information that you give me. You tell me what the Hamiltonian is and you tell me the dimensionality of Hilbert space and you're done. So all of this stuff that you're used to from classical physics or even from a traditional approach to quantum gravity, things like 
space, <laughs> fields, particles, forces, interactions, all of that stuff, none of that appears in this language, right? In the language of just a, a Hamiltonian acting on Hilbert space. What you are looking for ideally is a recipe or an algorithm from which you can derive space and fields and interactions and all that stuff from the bare bones quantum description. And the quantum language you're allowed to use are things like vectors in Hilbert space, the Hamiltonian density matrices, entanglement, stuff like that, okay? Good old quantum words are supposed to be fundamental. We derive an emergent classical description from that. That's the game we're going to be playing today. Now, you might think I, that this is just redundant because I've already said it, but I'll say it again because this is a, a very entrenched habit that people have. You might think, now, wait a minute. When I'm given the Hamiltonian, it actually tells me what it's a Hamiltonian of, right? It's not just some operator in the abstract sense. It's some physical, tangible thing. So like, if you're given this Hamiltonian, you know what that is. That's the simple harmonic oscillator, right? I mean, there's the momentum term, there's the potential, there you go. I can look at that and know that physically that's a simple harmonic oscillator, right? Well, sure, but that's because you're cheating. <laughs> this form of the Hamiltonian is the form of a Hamiltonian in a very specific basis in Hilbert space, namely the position basis, right? You can tell because the position operator is just a multiplication, momentum operator is a differential operator. So this is the Hamiltonian in a particular basis that happens to be extremely physically enlightening for this particular problem. Who gave you that? right? Like what right do you have to start there? How do you know to choose that basis? You can choose other bases for the harmonic oscillator also that are also physically transparent, but an arbitrary basis wouldn't be transparent at all, right? And presumably in quantum gravity, what we should be asking is, we don't know what the fundamental degrees of freedom are. Let's be agnostic about that. We don't know what the best basis to use is. We can't cheat by putting the Hamiltonian in some specific operator form. What we actually have is the Hamiltonian in its energy eigenbasis, right? That is the only preferred basis that you get by just having the Hamiltonian, okay? And when you have the Hamiltonian in the energy eigenbasis, it's diagonal by, by construction, right? All you really have, all the data you have to form your theory are the energy eigenvalues what is called the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So in this case, what you should imagine is you're given a spectrum of equally spaced energy eigenvalues with a minimum value, okay? Whenever anyone hands you uh, a, a spectrum of equally spaced energy eigenvalues with a minimum value, you go, oh yes, that's a harmonic oscillator, okay? But what about more general ones? What if you're just given some con collection from set of, some set of real numbers and you're asked the question, what is this? What is the physical thing that this corresponds to? That's a hard question. And it's one that no one really has tried to answer in a very general way. So we need to think about that a little bit. So how do you go from a list of energy eigenvalues, which is a very sparse, austere uh, set collection of data to an interpretation of that in terms of the physical structures that it's supposed to represent? Well, you know, we're allowed to use our experience. We're allowed to use the cases that we understand, like how did we know to express the simple harmonic oscillator in the uh, position basis anyway? The answer is because the world is not a simple harmonic oscillator all by itself. And this is almost always the answer when you have some difficult quantum mechanical interpretational problem, right? There's only one wave function, the wave function for the universe. There's not isolated little bits. That's the phenomenon of entanglement. That's why quantum mechanics is hard. So what's special about a certain basis that you use to describe the physical system is, it's the basis in which that subsystem is being observed by something in the outside world. So intuitively, we're gonna turn this into equations in a second, but intuitively we have some quantum system. We also have an environment and we also have an observer. And there is not just a Hamiltonian for the system, there's an interaction Hamiltonian and there's a Hamiltonian for the rest of the world as well. And it's that interaction between the observer and the system that picks out certain variables as special, as we will see. So more formally, you know that you decompose Hilbert space into subsystems by writing all of Hilbert space as a tensor product 
of the subsystems, right? And a useful decomposition into tensor product factors are those that will allow a classical description of the system when such a classical description is appropriate. You know, this is, a, this is something you have to keep in mind. If you were Laplace's demon, if you had perfect knowledge of everything, right, and you could do infinite calculations in whatever time you wanted, you would never have to talk about subsystems, branches of the wave function. You would just know the entire wave function of the universe all the time. Any of this talk of dividing the world into subsystems, et cetera, from the quantum point of view is something that is done for the convenience of human beings because it's, it's computationally simpler. It's, it's algorithmically simpler. So what we're looking for is ways to divide up Hilbert space into pieces so that we can describe the individual pieces in simple ways. And the only thing we have to look for, the only thing we have to work with in that task is the Hamiltonian. So the question we're asking is, we have a Hamiltonian a set of energy eigenvalues acting as an operator from the Hilbert space to itself. How does that help us decide how to factorize Hilbert space into subsystems, okay? Well, if we factorize Hilbert space into subsystems, if you posit some particular way of writing the whole Hilbert space as a tensor product of two different subsystems, then the Hamiltonian also comes along for the ride in a decomposed form, okay? Once you give me a proposed factorization of H into HA tensor HB, then the Hamiltonian has a piece that only acts on the subsystem, a piece that acts on everything else, on B, and a piece that is the interaction between them, okay? So this is the information we have from which we can judge whether or not that was a good way of dividing Hilbert space up into subsystems, okay? So what do you mean by good way? I've been very vague about like useful and good and stuff like that. What are the down to earth tangible criteria that we use to judge whether a given factorization of Hilbert space gives us some sort of classical limit, okay? Well, there's actually two different aspects of classical behavior if you're doing this carefully. Uh, there's the, the aspect that you're taught about when you take undergraduate quantum mechanics. There's a whole nother thing lurking on in the background. Here's what you're taught in undergraduate quantum mechanics, the Ehrenfest theorem, right? If you imagine just having a classical system, which has Newton's laws in the Hamiltonian form, okay, then what Ehrenfest tells you is that if your quantum mechanical wave function is very localized, and specifically if, it, if its characteristic length scale uh, for changing is smaller than the scale over which a potential is changing, then you can write the you know, F equals MA equation here in a form that looks like it's classical form, right? I mean, it's always true that the expectation value of momentum has a time derivative given by this, but when the wave packet is narrow, you can pull those expectation value signs inside the potential and just say, there's a potential, it's pushing on the particle in a certain way. That's where the classical limit in the Ehrenfest case comes from. So if you have a, a quantum system that is big and macroscopic, like the Earth, okay, this very big macroscopic system, the Earth goes around the sun. If you start the center of mass of the Earth in a very, very localized wave packet, it will remain localized to a very, very good approximation. The Earth does not smear out over its orbit around the sun in a short time scale. Okay, so this is the general, this is what you're taught as the usual classical limit of a quantum mechanical system. But there is something else going on, which is that sometimes you would think that if you just let quantum uh, evolution go on, systems would evolve into macroscopic superpositions. Their wave packets would not remain localized. Uh, Schrodinger's cat is the obvious example here. This is precisely why Schrodinger invented his cat example, to show that you could, in principle, in quantum theory, have macroscopic superpositions. And we never observe those, and that's a, that's a worry. In the modern world, we say, well, I know why we shouldn't worry about that. And the answer is decoherence, right? If you have the cat, I, I don't like to kill the cat. So in my version of Schrodinger's cat, the cat's either awake or asleep, not alive or dead. But it's the same physics behind it, OK? The point is that if you did have a cat in a superposition of awake and asleep, there's an environment around it. For instance, the photons in the box. And that environment would interact differently with the awake cat and the asleep cat. This photon in the environment, for example, would be absorbed by the awake cat and would just pass right by the sleeping cat. So instantly or very, very, very quickly, far longer, far shorter than it takes you as a human being the time to open the box, 
there's entanglement between the cat and the environment, and that is decoherence, okay? That's why in the Everettian language, that's why you never see a cat in a superposition of awake and asleep, because that decoherence leads to branching. And the branching has already happened long before you've opened the box. So that's why you never see states like this for classical systems, because there's an environment that is monitoring them. And decoherence happens very rapidly. And you notice this is a completely different discussion than the Ehrenfest theorem discussion. Why don't you see this quantum superposition? Why do you see classical cats? Because the environment monitors them. You need to take the environment into account to get this right. Hyperion is another example. Hyperion, some of you might be aware, it's a moon of Saturn, which has this uh, unusual irregular shape so that it's, it's tumbling is technically chaotic, okay? The time scale for uh, uncertainties in the orientation of Hyperion to become unpredictable is short on solar system time scales. So if it weren't for decoherence, this picture of Hyperion would not be accurate. The actual picture of Hyperion would just be a blob that's all smeared out because you would see its quantum wave function because the small variation in its initial wave function of its position would quickly smear out because of its chaotic motion. That doesn't happen because there's decoherence, because Hyperion is monitored by all the photons that are bumping into it from the sun and the microwave background, etc. So this environmental monitoring causing decoherence enforces classical behavior. And these are in two different regimes, so you need both. When you're asking the question, how do I divide my Hilbert space into system tensored into environment so as to best ensure that the system itself behaves classically, I need to look for two things at once. I need to look, localized states are going to remain localized, mostly, unless you build a Schrodinger's cat kind of operation, and entangled states remain unentangled. So if you go back to the cat, if you start in a superposition of awake and asleep, it will instantly become entangled, right, with the environment because of this decoherence. But if you start with a cat awake all by itself, it doesn't quickly become entangled with the environment. It's macroscopic coherence means that it just sort of is being monitored by the environment, but the entanglement rate is not growing in any way. So therefore, this is what we want. We want to look for, if, if the specific factorization we care about is into system and environment, we want to look for a factorization where the system Hamiltonian by itself has the property that the system remains localized when you just let it evolve all by itself. And the interaction Hamiltonian by itself has the property that the system remains unentangled in the same variable. So there's an interplay here, okay? But the interaction Hamiltonian represents how the environment, what feature of the system is being monitored by the environment. And the system Hamiltonian says what feature of the environment remains localized. We want those to be compatible. Okay, and if you just write down an arbitrary Hamiltonian, that is to say a generic randomly selected choice uh, of energy eigenspectrum, a set of eigenvalues, there will be no decomposition into system environment in which this happens. The real world, you'll be unsurprised to learn, the Hamiltonian of the real world is not generic. There are specific features about the Hamiltonian of the real world that let this happen, that let a classical limit evolve. So to dig in a little bit to uh, the machinery of doing this, a lot of this was set up by Zurek. Uh, again, he assumed that he knew what the factorization was, but we're putting it to work to derive what the right factorization is. So the thing about decoherence is that even though it's always true that if you have a subsystem and it has a reduced density matrix, you can always diagonalize the reduced density matrix. That's not a trick. The point of decoherence is that there is a special basis for the subsystem where you know ahead of time it will become very, very close to diagonal in that basis. That's the pointer basis in Zurek's terminology. So for the cat, it's the cat's awake and the cat's asleep. Those are the two basis states for the cat, the two pointer states. It's the pointer states that are robust under being monitored by the environment. These are the ones that the environment monitors it, it entangles, but then it is not continued to entangle over and over again. So the pointer states are defined by a pointer observable. There is some feature of the system that you monitor by looking at it with the environment. And the quantum measurement limit is when you can almost ignore the system Hamiltonian. Like when you have the Schrodinger's cat, 
The fact that it quickly decoheres into the awake and asleep basis doesn't depend on the momentum of the cat, right? That's not what we care about. What we care about is what are we observing about the cat? So in the quantum measurement limit, it's the interaction Hamiltonian that matters. And you can think of that interaction Hamiltonian as being what the observer measures about the system. You want that observable to commute with the interaction Hamiltonian. This is the slightly more formal way of saying that the entanglement between the system and the observer does not continue to increase after decoherence has occurred. Once you're in an eigenstate of the pointer observable, that is to say, once you're in a pointer state, then you're just being monitored passively by the environment. There's not a continual dynamical process. So for example, this is why we think of naturally simple harmonic oscillators, you know, balls moving on springs as having locations. It's because that's in the real world what the, what the environment is monitoring the physical position of the ball on the spring. So the position observable is a natural pointer observable in these contexts. So that's the, uh, what is being, uh, what we want to have happen. How do we quantitatively make it happen? So the point is we want to sort of imagine the space of all possible factorizations. We want to imagine all possible ways to factorize Hilbert space into system times environment for every such candidate for every such possible factorization, we will say, what's the best we can do at picking an observable that the environment is monitoring, okay? That's gonna be called the candidate pointer observable. It's the thing that does its best to commute with the interaction Hamiltonian. And you can formalize this. We wrote a paper, there's a paper I wrote with Ashmeet Singh recently, just uh, uh, last year on the archive. Uh, so you calculate the commutator between the interaction Hamiltonian and this this candidate pointer observable tensored into whatever some operator on the environment, it doesn't matter, and you minimize the norm of this guy, okay? Then you construct an initially unentangled state, right? So you start unentangled completely. Schrodinger's cat really is in the superposition of awake and asleep. It's not entangled with the environment, and then you let it go. You let the interaction Hamiltonian interact with it, okay? And then you calculate its entropy, and you're looking for states that are, the entropy does not grow very quickly. The entropy is a measurement of the entanglement between the system and the environment. The real entropy, the von Neumann entropy is trace is minus trace rho log rho. That's harder to calculate. Those of you who have done this on computers know that it's much simpler uh, just to calculate what is called the linear entropy is still a dimensionless measurement of entanglement growth, but it's easier to calculate. Uh, more formally, you might want to use the von Neumann entropy, but this is good enough for the numerical answers I'm going to show you in a second. So this is how we ask the question, what kinds of states remain robust, remain unentangled when they're being monitored by the environment? The other question we want to ask is, what kinds of states remain localized? Because we're looking for dynamics that will give us a classical limit. So the obvious thing to characterize localization is you just calculate the standard deviation or the variance of some observable, okay? So you have some observable. We already know what observable we want. We have the candidate, I shouldn't point to my own screen, it doesn't help you. The candidate pointer observable is the one that we want to remain localized. So you say, well, let's calculate the variance of that and see whether it just spreads out all over the place. And you could do that, that would be intellectually respectable, but the problem is, we, it's dimensionful. We can't compare it to this linear entropy, which is what we want to eventually do. So rather than use the variance, which is the obvious robust thing, we can define what we call the pointer entropy. So if you imagine you have the density matrix for the system, okay, and it's spread out in, in some basis, it's going to be very close to diagonal. So it's just spread out along the diagonal and this is something where you don't want it to spread very much, right? You want it to stay more or less in a, in a localized wave packet in the space of all possible pointer states. And you can, you can characterize that with what we call the pointer entropy. So this is just the uh, energy, the, the, the eigenvalues of the density matrix in the pointer basis, okay? And then you can check just to, as a reality check that what you really care about, the variance of the observable and this new thing that we define, the linear entropy, oops, that's not supposed to be the linear entropy. It should be the pointer entropy. Sorry, that's a typo. The pointer entropy uh, are me basically measuring the same thing. So this is in a bunch of different simulations. You see there's a very tight correlation between the variance of the pointer observable and the pointer entropy. 
So we're, we, we think that we are measuring what we want to measure. So given all that set up, thank you for being patient and, and listening to me. Uh, here's a payoff. This is what we call the quantum muriology algorithm. Muriology is the word. It's not a misspelling of uh, metrology or meteorology. It's really a word. Muriology is what the philosophers use to talk about the relationship of wholes and parts. Okay. So quantum muriology is here. I'm giving you the entire Hilbert space. How do I divide it into subsystems? And this is our algorithm for doing it. You think about every possible way of dividing Hilbert space into subsystems. For each factorization, you can define a pointer observable by the criterion that it, it is the thing that commutes the most with the interaction Hamiltonian. You start the state in an eigenstate of that. It, number one, it's unentangled. And number two, the system is in an eigenstate of that pointer observable. And then you, in the space of all such factorizations, you look for the one that minimizes what we call the Schwinger entropy, which is just the maximum value of that linear entropy telling you how entangled it is, and that pointer entropy telling you how quickly it spreads. We know from experience in the real world that real physical classical systems neither spread nor become entangled very quickly. So we don't want either one of these to be big. So that's our proposed algorithm for uh, dividing Hilbert space into systems and environments. And we showed in a very, very simple system that it gets the right answer, okay? So in a simple system, by what I mean is here are two harmonic oscillators, the red one and the blue one. And I've given them a very weak interaction between them, okay? So I know how to write that down the Hamiltonian for this. I can diagonalize it, I can get the energy eigenvalues. And we want to recover the fact that the description I just gave you is the right one, okay? The description I just gave you is there's an oscillator here, there's an oscillator there, there's a weak interaction between them. So that is a specific factorization of the system. Uh, and I wanna know that my algorithm recovers that factorization and it does. So here is the Schwinger entropy that we want to minimize. Here is the quasi-classical factorization that we start with. We think we know what two harmonic oscillators look like, okay? And here we just sort of pushed away from the correct factorization by doing a big unitary transformation in Hilbert space. We made the, the factorization less and less like the correct one. And what we find is indeed the Schwinger entropy gets bigger and bigger. The, so we cheated in the sense that we knew what the right answer was in this case, but we claim that you could go the other way around. If you didn't know what the right factorization was and you just searched through, you would quickly find that the minimum value of the Schwinger entropy does in fact give you exactly the physical ordinary factorization. It tells you that this really is two coupled harmonic oscillators. So we think that we have, uh, it's a little bit, you know, there's a lot of approximations that came into this, but we think we have a way of saying, given a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is just a list of energy eigenvalues, we think we have an algorithm that will tell you, here is how to factorize that Hilbert space into system and environment, or into two interacting subsystems, or whatever you like. Uh, that will be useful in a second. But let me just do one little detour here, because we learned something interesting that we weren't quite planning to learn, and we're, we're still trying to chase down the implications of this. Um, we know that locality plays a crucial role in why there is a classical limit in the real world. Um, the locality appears in quantum field theory, of course, but even if you were just doing you know, ordinary part non-relativistic particle quantum mechanics, there's still locality in the sense that interactions are local, right? I mean, again, forget about EPR and Alice and Bob. The Hamiltonian says that two subsystems bump into each other when they're at the same point in space, okay? Subsystems do not bump into each other when they're at the same momentum or something like that. So that's an interesting feature of the world. If you think about, you know, um, classical mechanics uh, from the Hamiltonian point of view, you know, Newton, when he invented classical mechanics, he started with positions and momentum was a derived quantity. But in Hamiltonian mechanics, positions and momenta are on an equal footing, right? P and Q, you can just do a canonical transformation. You can pick whatever P's and Q's you want. So from the Hamiltonian dynamics point of view, it's an interesting question to ask, why is position special? Why do we think we live in position space and not in momentum space, okay? Um, and the answer absolutely comes down to the fact that interactions are local in position. In fact, you can turn that around and you can say space, the three-dimensional space of locations in which we you know, put tables and chairs and things like that, 
space is the set of variables in terms of which interactions are local. I think that's basically correct. But it begs a question, why is there any set of variables in terms of which interactions are local, okay? So you can think about that in terms of the Hamiltonian by saying that the Hamiltonian for systems that we know about in the real world generally takes a form something like this, p squared plus v of q, okay? This is where the difference between position and momentum come in. The Hamiltonian is not an arbitrary function of p and q. Hamiltonians for real world systems, roughly speaking, and I know there's exceptions, but roughly speaking, there's a, just a kinetic energy there in the Hamiltonian, but then the potential is where all the interactions happen. If you think of P and Q as being multi-component vectors, uh, different subsystems are gonna interact as a function of where their positions are, not as a function of where the momentum are. So this is the question, this is the more formal form of the question, why does the Hamiltonian of the real world, or why do Hamiltonians in the real world tend to look like this? So the answer that we tentatively have is that even though, sure, in classical mechanics, in the Hamiltonian formulation, you can write down any function you want of P and Q. If you start with a quantum theory and you ask yourself, I want a quantum theory that has a good classical limit, you will not get any old Hamiltonian in that classical limit. The Hamiltonians that work have this form. And that comes out of our algorithm from the fact that the environment is monitoring some particular feature of the system. And that feature wants to be collimated, as we said. It's, it, it wants its wave packet to remain localized, okay? So this interaction is what picks out the location, the position as something special. And then the fact that it's P squared is what makes it be localized. If this were not P squared, if this were some arbitrary function of P, then that wave packet would delocalize very, very quickly. So in some sense, the reason why there is something we can call position is because that's a feature of getting a classical limit out of a quantum theory. Maybe it's because of quantum mechanics that position that we don't live in momentum space, that we live in position space. Again, this is a little bit more tentative, but I wanted to throw it out there uh, for you to think about. That was just an aside. So let's get back to the main theme. So I talked about um, factorizing Hilbert space, okay? And the ultimate goal of this is not just Schrodinger's cat, it's quantum gravity, right? I know it's a big leap to go from that to that, but ultimately this is the game we wanna play. We wanna say you have some giant Hamiltonian, you have some very big, even though finite dimensional Hilbert space, and I want to see all of space-time emerge from it. That sounds hopeless, but it's actually, uh, it's a lot more hopeful than you might have thought. So let's think about what clues we get from quantum field theory in this, uh, in this quest. So th the point here is we're not starting by assuming quantum field theory, but we know that at the end of the day in the infrared low energy limit, we want to get physics that is very well described by quantum field theory, right? We want to map on a quantum field theory in some approximation. So we have a target to shoot for. And we know that, again, this is not exactly true, but in some pretty good approximation in quantum field theory, this is space, okay? This picture right here, I've divided space into different subregions, and I can associate with each subregion a factor of Hilbert space. Again, this is not exactly true in gauge theories, there's technicalities, but it's good enough for what we're doing today. Just imagine a scalar field theory if that's what you want to do. So the point is there's a quantum field theory defined through space. I can write its Hilbert space as the tensor product of everything going on in every individual region of space. And then the locality of quantum field theory tells me that the Hamiltonian written in this decomposition will only connect nearest neighbors, okay? So a degree of freedom in this little circle right there does not directly interact with the degree of freedom over there. It only interacts with its nearest neighbors, okay? So that gives me an enormous amount of information. That's an extremely strong constraint on the form of the Hamiltonian. So if you get, once again, if you're given a decomposition like this, then you can write the Hamiltonian. So this is a decomposition of Hilbert space. It lets me decompose the Hamiltonian into a self Hamiltonian for every little region, a two point interaction for every pair of two regions, three point interactions for every triplet and so forth. And if you want it to be a local Hamiltonian effectively, then what you're telling me is, I want there to this, this uh, infinite series to not be infinite. 
I want it to end at some point because I only want the nearest neighbors to actually have interactions with each other. So that is called a K local Hamiltonian. And guess what? Uh, we were scooped, we were thinking about this, but a, a set of students from Stanford actually beat us to the punch, Cutler, Pennington, and Renard, uh, investigated this, this problem. Given just the energy eigenspectrum of the Hamiltonian, can you derive what is the right way to decompose into little bits with only local interactions? And what they found is most Hamiltonians have no local factorization. So if you just try to factorize a a generic Hamiltonian in this way, you will have an infinite series of interactions, like it or not, no matter how you pick your uh, factorization. But sometimes certain Hamiltonians, again, the Hamiltonian in the real world is not generic. Certain Hamiltonians have a local factorization. And when that exists, it's mostly unique. And the reason why is because this particular form, if you truncate this at some k, then this form is highly non-generic and the number of parameters in it is much, much less than the dimensionality of Hilbert space. So what that means is, again, there's no constructive algorithm here, but you can search through the space of all possible factorizations. And just from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, you could, you could find this network structure in Hilbert space. And it would define what parts of Hilbert space interact with what other parts, OK? This gives you a topology on this discre discrete uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space. And then you could actually take the continuum limit, or at least you know, if it's big enough, you could say, what is the best fit continuum manifold? And you could ask questions like, does this describe a one-dimensional space, a two-dimensional space, et cetera? But the topology of space can be derived in this picture directly from the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. You don't put it in by hand. Now, you might ask, well, why does space have one dimension or two dimensions. I don't know, that's above my pay grade, but the Hamiltonian determines what it is. We wanna do more than that. We, don't, we want more than just the topology of this uh, discrete approximation to physical space. We want the geometry of it, right? And the Hamiltonian is not gonna be enough for that because the Hamiltonian gives us a fixed structure. The Hamiltonian does not change with time. We want a dynamical geometry. So the obvious place to look is an entanglement you not only have the Hamiltonian on this state, but you look at something near the vacuum, okay? And you look at the entanglement between different kinds of regions. Now, this is again, an aside here, I'm just telling you here, but there's a big program that you've all heard of uh, deriving space-time from entanglement. Almost all of that entanglement, almost all that work is deriving the geometry of space-time from entanglement in the boundary of an ADS-C of T kind of setup, okay? So in ADS-C of T, you have a quantum state on the boundary, conformal field theory, and the entanglement structure there, as was pointed out by Swingle and Van Romtonk and others, determines the geometry of the emergent bulk, okay? Uh, so I'm not doing that. So I love it. Go ahead, do it, ADS-C of T, it's great. But I, am as a, I was trained as a cosmologist. I, I know from data that the cosmological constant is a positive number, not a negative number. I want to derive features of quantum gravity here in my local neighborhood that do not depend on positing anti de Sitter boundary conditions. So what I'm gonna care about is can we derive the geometry from entanglement right here in this room or right here in the solar system, right? Describing why apples fall from trees, why the earth goes around the sun using entanglement in a quantum mechanical sense, okay? Can we do that? So we're not thinking about black holes, the Big Bang, anti de Sitter space. We're thinking about weak field gravity where physics looks approximately local. You know, once you have horizons, locality becomes more problematic. But here in the solar system, gravity looks like a local quantum field theory. So here's the thing that we know about local quantum field theories. Not only are different regions of space entangled with each other, but there's a relationship between the distance between two regions and the amount of entanglement. Nearby regions are highly entangled. Distant regions are entangled, but not very much. There's a very low amount of entanglement. The entanglement fades away as you get further and further away. So this is a fact you can derive in quantum field theory in a background space time. We are suggesting you can turn it around. This is just a, a, an axiom, an assumption, a, an ansatz, if you want. We're saying the entanglement is what we can actually calculate in our picture. We're going to guess that you can use that entanglement to define a metric on space. And the metric is given by a distance measure that says if you're highly entangled, you're nearby. If you're not very entangled, you're far away. We can quantify that. I, I think you know this. I think I already assumed that you know this. But given two subsystems, 
um, of a quantum system. You can get the reduced density matrix of one. You can calculate its entropy. And if those two subsystems were the only two subsystems in the world, that would tell you how entangled they were. If they're not the only two subsystems in the world, then it's better to use what is called the mutual information. So the mutual information is is a way of figuring out how much entanglement there is just between these two subsystems, not these two subsystems in the rest of the world, okay? So it's the entropy of one plus the entropy of the other minus the entropy of both of them combined. So if there's no entanglement between them, but there's a lot of entanglement between them and the rest of the world, the mutual information will be zero because these will exactly cancel out. And if you're a particle physicist or a high energy theorist, this is essentially a way of talking about the two point function between operators in this particular quantum field theory. Uh, it's a normalized version of the two-point function, or rather it's an upper bound on the normalized version of the two-point function. But the mutual information is better for us to, to use because the two-point function is with associated with some observable, right? You have some operator and you calculate its two-point function. We don't want to depend on any choice of operator. We want to just depend on the quantum system itself. So that's given by the mutual information. So here's our guess. Our guess is you can basically define a metric in the right circumstances when it works at all, okay? You can define a metric minus log of the mutual information. So the entanglement is large, the distance is small and vice versa. And we can actually use this as a check. So these are two cases uh, where we actually know what the entanglement structure is and we forget it, right? We actually say, okay, we don't know what the, what the system is. Can we derive just by using applied math techniques that this was, for example, a one-dimensional system. And this was, for example, a two-dimensional system. And the answer is yes, we can derive those things. So the, the operation of starting from the data given by this ansatz and recovering a best fit classical geometry seems to be plausible in some way, okay? So what, we're, what we have then, what that leaves us with is there's a relationship between geometry and entanglement, which we posited. There's clearly a relationship between entanglement and entropy, you know that. If only there was a relationship between entropy and energy, we'd be in good shape. Then we'd have a relationship between geometry and energy. But of course, there's a relationship between entropy and energy. People in the 19th century could have told you that, right? The change of entropy of a system has to do with the heat moving in or out of the system at fixed temperature in the good old phenomenological thermodynamic sense. Turns out that a relationship like this has a, an upgraded version in the purely quantum context called the entanglement first law. You can define something, I'm not gonna go into the details. You can define something called the um, modular Hamiltonian that is just based on the density matrix. It's not actually based on the real Hamiltonian. And the change in the modular Hamiltonian is proportional to the change of the entropy. And then in the right limit, in the infrared limit for a quantum field theory, you can relate the modular Hamiltonian to the actual energy density. And what's physically going on here is in the vacuum state, there's a very, very specific entanglement structure between all these subsystems. And if you go away from the vacuum state, if you change the state a little bit, basically you have to change that entanglement structure. Otherwise you'd still be in the vacuum, okay? So there's always going to be a relationship between energy and entanglement. What that means is, by the uh, logic I just showed you, there's a relationship between effective emergent geometry that was based on entanglement and the effective emergent energy that you have in your state. And this, of course, is at the heart of what you and I know and love as gravity, right? As Einstein's theory of general relativity. Again, I'm trying to put too much into this uh, talk, so I'm not gonna get to go into all the details. We've written papers about it, so you can read them, but here is the finding chart. Here's the schematic uh, flow chart for how this is supposed to work. This is based on ideas from Ted Jacobson. And what Ted was trying to do was to say, okay, I have space time and I have some quantum fields in space time. I wanna derive Einstein's equation in that context. The only difference here is that we don't have space time. We emerge space time itself from the quantum structure, but otherwise it's the same kind of system. So you have uh, the top level that you have here is your starting point. It's right now, it's just an ansatz. We can't quite derive it yet, but we're working on that. There, if you change the entropy of a subregion of your space, that changes the emergent effective area of the boundary of that uh, subsystem. And then it's just math. A change in the area of a small region of space can be related to the Einstein tensor. A change of the entropy in a small subset of Hilbert space can be related to the energy density. 
And then that's in some particular Lorentz frame. If you posit that this is going to be true in all Lorentz frames, which again is a huge posit that we cannot derive right now, but we're working on, then you must have Einstein's equation be true in any uh, rest in any rest frame. So what this means is that um, what we have, what we've written in our most recent papers, is not a derivation, but uh, a set of axioms, a set of assumptions you have to make. It's a wish list. We have like eleven different things. If these eleven things all turn out to be true in the real world, then you can actually derive an effective dynamical spacetime metric from the entanglement structure in a quantum state and show that that emergent space-time metric obeys the Einstein equation in the weak field limit, which is very far from where we want to be, but still very exciting all by itself. Because you notice I didn't use words like string theory or dynamical triangulations or causal sets or loops. I didn't use any pre-existing structure. I just used Hilbert space and vectors and entanglement. So that's the aspirational program, starting with nothing but Hilbert space in a Hamiltonian figure out how to divide up Hilbert space by looking for a classical limit, use the entanglement structure of the wave function in that divided up Hilbert space to define an emergent space-time geometry, show that that emergent space-time geometry obeys Einstein's equation. So there's many ways in which this program could crash and burn. We don't even have black holes yet, right? There's a long way to go, but I like it even if it turns out not to be the most efficient way of quantizing gravity, Philosophically, I think it's attractive because it really takes the quantumness of the theory seriously. We start from the real quantum beginning. Presumably nature does not start from a classical theory and quantize it. Nature starts from a quantum theory and gives us a classical limit. We're just trying to follow in nature's footsteps. Thank you very much. Uh, the first raised hand is from Tim Palmer. So Tim, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I, I'm Tim Palmer from Oxford. Um, thank, thanks, Sean, for a very nice talk. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, well, linked to the following observation, that when you discussed uh, the, the quantum formalism, you seem to be mostly basing it on traditional non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And I, I wonder if the concept of emergence of a local space-time makes sense in the context of non-relativistic quantum mechanics on the basis that if you, for example, Newtonian gravity is, is notoriously non-local because it has action at a distance. Um, and, and, the, and of course it was relativity that, that um, enabled us to talk meaningfully about the causal structures of space time. So I'm wondering that my question is basically whether you think there's a particular role for relativistic quantum mechanics in your program of emergent locality for space and space time that you haven't perhaps emphasized so far in your talk? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very good question. And I think this is just, it's entirely my fault because I was trying to really kind of talk about two different sets of papers that are connected in my mind, but harder to connect elsewhere. I mean, the whole idea of the quantum myriology and breaking things up into the system and environment, all of my examples, just like you say, were basically non-relativistic quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's cat, harmonic oscillators, et cetera. But when I shifted that to the context of getting emergent space time, all the examples in the back of my mind are quantum field theories, are relativistic quantum field theories. Uh, that's the context in which this whole idea that you have degrees of freedom in empty space that have local degrees of entanglement between them, that's, that idea only makes sense in, in that context. So for all the second half of the talk, I was assuming uh, relativistic quantum field theory, basically. Now, having said that, the, the, the task of really making it relativistic in the sense of showing that Lorentz invariance uh, arises as a good approximation is something we haven't done at all. You know, one of the most interesting and exciting things about this to me is that if you take seriously the idea that Hilbert space is finite dimensional, even just within our horizon, um, there are no representations of non-compact symmetry groups on finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So, Lorentz invariance cannot be exact in such a model. So this, this predicts there should be some violations of Lorentz invariance. I have no idea whether they're big enough to be observable, but that's something that needs to be looked at more carefully. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next in line, we have uh, uh, Richard Healy. Richard. 
Yeah, I have a question about the uh, Mariology algorithm. Uh, in your initial discussion, uh, in addition to a system and an environment, there was also an observer. Um, and presumably observers are uh, going to be taken to be physical in this context. So we actually have a, a threefold physical split rather than a twofold split. Um, and then later on, when we start trying to build up uh, space, we have uh, a much uh, larger uh, myriology with every region um, contributing. So maybe you could just explain uh, a little more carefully, or at least so I understand better. I'm sure your explanation was very careful to start with, um, what the relation is between these three ways of, of building a myriology. Yeah, very, very good, actually, um, because I, I cheated a little bit there. I showed you an observer because you're used to thinking about observers, you're used to being observers, uh, but I really only work with the environment and the system interaction. In the back of my mind, here's what's going on. The environment is interacting with the system and the environment's also interacting with us, with the observer or, you know, the observer, like you say, in my, my picture is completely physical. It's a factor of Hilbert space, et cetera. And so there needs to be some compatibility there. Uh, the, the, the feature of, the system that is monitored by the environment also needs to be the, the feature of the system that is observed by the observer, right? And you know, we know that's true in simple cases. We not only does uh, the environment monitor Schrodinger's catch to collapse it onto physically, macroscopically coherent uh, states in space, but when we look at it, that's what we see. So yes, I completely agree that a more full discussion would show you why those two things are compatible, basically because the cat and I are not that different, <laughs> right? I mean, our, the thing that is being monitored by the environment in both of us is the same, and it's not a coincidence that it's what we observe about each other, but there is more to be said about it for sure. Mm -hmm. But what about the regions of space where the myriology gets much bigger? Well, yes, but it's a similar thing. I mean, again, again, there is much more to say, and there I think I can even, I have probably figured that out less in my brain, but the, the crucial feature of quantum field theory that we are using is locality in space. And we, we have, you know, in some sense that um, fits into the muriology algorithm, but it's in a different sense, because honestly what we care about most is the vacuum or, or almost vacuum states, right? We, we're, not, we're not caring about Schrodinger's cat in that context. So uh -huh. the specifics of putting an observer in and so forth don't quite fit into that uh, yes. language quite as well. So you'd have to do more work to relate them, but I think it's very doable. I mean, look, this is full employment. This is a recent thing. I encourage <laughs> everyone in the audience to write papers and cite us. I think this is a, you know, a lot of stuff yet to be done. Thank you. Lorenzo Maccone is the next, Lorenzo. Uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? Um... Yes. Great. Uh, so, so you started by pointing out that uh, the basic features of quantum mechanics are the Hilbert space dimension and the Hamiltonian. But in a in a general relativity, that's not going to work very well, right? Because you, of course, you don't have a Schrodinger equation. So, I guess in general relativity, you are talking about something like. Hamiltonian constraints or wheeler to wheel equation or something like that, I guess. But even that's not going to work very well because not all general relativity is, can be formulated in a Hamiltonian fashion. So I guess you need like a globally hyperbolic uh, uh, space time to do that, right? So how is it going to work? Well, I mean, I would like to know how that is going to work. This is okay. absolutely things that we need to understand better. Um, so just to be clear, you know, uh, it, if it turns out that the fundamental equation of reality uh, is not the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation that I showed you, but something like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, um, h psi equals zero, for those of you who are not familiar with it, then by itself, that would render this entire program impossible to follow. Because if all he has h psi equals zero, there's no information in the Hamiltonian from which you can derive anything. Okay. Um, nice. You need to be given a, a specific basis uh, that is somehow preferred on for reasons other than uh, their eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Now, usually, I, so there's, there's sort of two things I can say, neither one of which is completely 
satisfying, but they're both true and maybe they point us in the right direction. One thing is um, when you do have the uh, Wheeler DeWitt equation, um, you typically, when you're sort of addressing problem of time kinds of issues and you want to see how time arises in quantum gravity or even in classical gravity, um, you, you say that time is emergent, it's relational within um, the, the Hilbert space somehow. And what that means is that there's somehow, there is something, some preferred thing that will emerge uh, that, that acts like the time variable. And one way of seeing this is to write the Wheeler-DeWitt Hamiltonian capital H, uh, where capital H psi equals zero, you can write capital H as little h minus i d by dt for some emergent time parameter t. And then you say that it's little h that is sort of effectively doing the time evolution. And then if you have that, if, whatever, if, if you have that either fundamentally because God told you or whatever, then you can run our entire program based on little h, not on big h. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that all of general relativity might just be uh, an approximation. Uh, maybe the idea of diffeomorphism invariance, the idea of the, these global constraints in the Hamiltonian formulation just aren't fundamental. They're just a, a pretty good uh, way of talking in a certain regime, which is not the most fundamental one. So I'm very open-minded about that. You know, we. We definitely admit that in some sense, we're taking a step backward by saying that the fundamental equation is H psi equals I D by DT psi. We're taking time as fundamental in some sense. Right. And okay. Lorentz invariance, diff diffeomorphism invariance, all that stuff is going to have to come out in the macroscopic um, IR approximation. It's going to have to emerge. And yeah, we need to understand how that would happen better. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, very nice talk, by the way. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, next in line, we have uh, Joanna Lutz. Joanna, go ahead. Thank you. Um, you said that uh, your preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics is the Everettian one. And I'm just wondering to what extent your project relies on uh, assuming this particular interpretation, um, for example, at which point uh, would it break down if uh, we added uh, the collapse of the wave function, if any? Good, yeah. So I think, I mean, this is an interesting thing because look, I'll confess, I my devotion to the ever interpretation is nearly entire. So uh, I don't spend that much time uh, thinking about how to do it in other interpretations. But Everett both sort of is the context in which this entire program, this entire problem gets raised and also gives us the resources to try to solve it. So it, as far as I can tell, and again, I'm not an expert, but as far as I can tell in every other interpretation of quantum mechanics, you have more structure that you are given from the start than just the Hamiltonian and Hilbert space, right? You're given the ways that wave function collapses in objective collapse models, or you're given some extra variables in pilot wave theories, right? So you're given more structure. Whereas it's only in Everett that you have to worry about this whole problem of deriving all that structure from almost nothing. Uh, and then so our claim is, but you can do it. And therefore, you know, Everett is fine on, in, in this um, context. And maybe it gives you hints. So my, my reason why even though, so let, let me put it this way. I would be sympathetic if someone said the entire need for a program like this should count as a strike against Everett. Because in other programs, you're just given the answer from the start, baked in, right? But the reason why I don't personally count that as a strike against Everett is because we have failed to quantize gravity effectively. And I suspect that in all these other uh, approaches where you are given structure from the start, you're not given the right structure because <laughs> we don't know what the right structure is. And in Everett, all the structure is determined dynamically. All you have is a set of energy eigenvalues. So you have to determine everything dynamically. So I, I'm open to the possibility that these other things, the other approaches would be compatible with what I'm saying, but they would not fit as nicely in. I think that 
I think that if I were really a pilot wave person or really an objective collapse person, I would think that this kind of program is a waste of time because I think I need to know ahead of time what that structure is. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Peter Morgan left uh, a question in the chat, so I will read it. If you're starting from only a Hilbert space and a unitary evolution, have you considered working in a Koopman's Hilbert space formalism for classical mechanics? There is a difference that the generator of evolution is not a positive operator. The chaotic dynamical systems literature is now full of uses of the Koopman operator as a finite time evolution. So the short answer is no. I've heard of, uh, you know, I've come across, like, like you allude to, many uses, many, many contexts in which the Koopman operator is, is talked about. I have no idea what it is. I've never uh, known to use it. Maybe I should, or maybe, maybe someone else should again and, and cite our papers. But uh, I think that that's, that that's the kind of thing I want to know better. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, Davide Romano uh, told me in the chat that he has a question. So Davide, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I have a problem with the, the hands option that <laughs> raise up and down independently from me. <laughs> uh, so yes, my, my question is about the, um, the role of the emergence of the position operator of position in general when there are interacting systems. Uh, so one thing that uh, made me doubt about this when I read the article of the coherence is, is this one. Um, so Usually the story is, okay, we have uh, a kind of uh, total Hamiltonian, we divide in pieces, and when the interaction Hamiltonian dominates, uh, usually the position is a pointer state. Okay, but if one looks at the mathematical model, uh, usually there are two main models. One is the scattering model, so the coherence induced by scattering, and the other is the quantum Brownian motion. Now in the scattering, we already assume a lot of things. We assume a particle that go around, so there is space, uh, it interacts at a certain point, there is already position, and it also uh, go down and there is no recoil. So there is uh, already a classical picture going on, I think. But in the quantum Brownian motion, maybe it's the better case because it's the most sophisticated and, and uh, it's used all the time. The, in the quantum Brownian motion, the interaction is described exactly uh, with the harmonic oscillator that you showed some slide before. And you said, this is not the correct way to think at the harmonic oscillator because we already skip in the position. Yeah. So the doubt that, doubt that I have is, okay, but if we model the interaction uh, with the coupling with the harmonic oscillator, which is already written in the position I went to space, we have position out, that's clear. Uh, from a physical point of view, I think it's totally fine. But does it explain uh, the position as privileged variable? Uh, should, should we not start from a coupling with an, an harmonic oscillator written in the energy eigenstates? And yeah. from there, showing that position emerge, for example. So that I, I was curious to, yeah, to, to, to hear your <laughs> idea about that. Well, I think, I mean, so if I, if I get, if I understand what you're getting at, um, there is something going on that deserves further investigation, which is this fact I alluded to a couple of times that in order for this program to work, the Hamiltonian has to take on the correct form. So the, the, the game we're playing is you give me a collection of energy eigenvalues and I emerge all these structures from it, but it almost never works <laughs> unless the Hamiltonian eigenvalues fit together yeah. in exactly the right way. You get to exactly. no class structure at all. So, you know, if someone else wants to say, well, look, I have my favorite theory of quantum gravity, it's string theory or loop quantum gravity or whatever. Um, maybe that's where these things come together because, you know, there is some actual Hamiltonian in the world that makes this work. And maybe that actual Hamiltonian does have a preferred way of talking about it that just sort of makes sense in that context because it's clearly not a generic Hamiltonian. So, 
all those are sort of vague words in my mind right now. I've not completely uh, spoken them out, but there's a lot of there's a lot of room for understanding better what kinds of Hamiltonians work and why we see certain kinds of things in the classical emergent world. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, I have a question, and uh, I think it is a question that uh, a metaphysician might ask you. So a metaphysician is interested in uh, uh, knowing uh, the um, dependence relation that links uh, your Hilbert space to the emergent uh, space-time. Because just saying that this relation is emergent uh, is not satisfactory for the metaphysician because uh, emergence uh, might signify everything and nothing at the same time. So um, do you have a concrete idea of uh, what is this kind of dependence relation? Is, uh, for example, identity trivially? So when we talk about uh, space-time, uh, this is just a um, more uh, um, simple way to talk about uh, uh, Hilbert space facts, or is it some other sort uh, of uh, dependence? Uh, uh, might be, I don't know, even causation or grounding uh, or some sort of generic supervenience uh, uh, or I don't know, composition, for example, since yeah. you talk about mereology. Um, but if that if it is composition, uh, what I find difficult is to understand how you can render in a physical sense this talk of composition when you don't have at your disposal pre-existing spatial temporal notions because I compose things by putting them side by side in, in a clear uh, spatial uh, fashion. So I, I would appreciate if you could uh, clarify a little bit more uh, this kind of relation between Hilbert space and space. Sure, yeah, I mean, so there's a lot going on there. Let me, let me try to see if I remember everything I wanna say. You know, I have an understanding of it that I thought was good enough, but I have lots of friends who are metaphysicians and they keep telling me it's not quite good enough. So I'm working uh, to make it better. Very, very quickly on that last point, you know, I do think that um, we need to divorce the idea of composition and muriology from the idea of spatiotemporal relations entirely. If this uh, approach is on the right track, uh, you can't make spatiotemporal relations be fundamental in anything. They're all just emergent approximations. But I think there are other ways of, of doing the work that spatiotemporal relations typically do. So I think of a I think of it as what I call figurative reductionism rather than literal reductionism when you're literally breaking things down into small pieces located in space, you're doing the work of reductionism by having a more comprehensive theory. But the, you know, the relation of reduction is not literally to different little regions of space. And that's what I would like to be true anyway. But to answer your main question, you know, I think, I think of it as a kind of a supervenience relation, um, but I, I, I am not yet 100% clear on the best way of saying this. So let me, rather than speak the language of, of metaphysics, let me tell you how I actually think about it. Um, I think about emergence as in, involving two things. There is number one, a map, from a comprehensive theory, from a sort of more microscopic fundamental theory to the emergent theory. And the map is many to one. So there are, there's a coarse graining operation where many different microstates look the same macroscopically, okay? Uh, number two, this, this map is compatible with evolution, with time evolution. So if I take microstates in the fundamental theory and I evolve them forward in time, uh, and or, and I, I map them to the macro theory and evolve them forward in time, I could then map at the end of the day and the whole thing commutes in a nice way. And I, I said two things, but there's really three things. That's the second thing. The third thing is uh, the, this map from microstates to macro states has to also be compatible with, and this is the tricky part, with what macro systems can observe about each other, right? So in the macro theory, there are things that you can observe. When I look at my cup of coffee, I cannot see the individual molecules of cream and coffee and whatever. I see that it has a certain size, I can feel it has a certain temperature and so forth. And so there can't be like secret 
microscopic information that is invisible to me in the macro theory that is crucial to understanding this dynamics. I have to be able to, from what I observe in the macro theory, predict the macro evolution, right? That, that needs to be uh, part of the thing. And I think all of those features are true in the examples that I've given you. It's really just, you know, a best fit classical smooth space time given this distance measure on a discrete Hilbert space and it kind of fits. But the but getting it right at the level of rigor that a true metaphysician would be happy with is something that I don't think has happened yet. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so before we start the second round of questions, uh, I'm wondering whether anyone who has not asked anything uh, till now want to ask a question. Um, uh, one of the users with no name, just a number, asks in the chat, what do you think about uh, the philosopher McDuckert? I don't know if you know yeah. his argument. So what do you what think, I think about, about McTaggart is that the labels A theory and B theory have to be the worst labels ever given to two different theories, because I can never remember which one is A and which one is B. Um, but I am a definite, you know, eternalist block universe kind of person. You know, I think at all moments of time are equally real in some sense. Now, I know that Steve has an angle on this that I think is actually a, a pretty good one, that the whole distinction is overblown, and I'm equally happy with that. Uh, but so I'm not someone, the, the, only, the only view that I would kind of not be happy with was one that gave some ontological special status to the present moment specifically. Okay, fine. Um, so, Baptiste has a question. Please go ahead, Baptiste. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, uh, I learned a lot. Um, my question is about, uh, again, a, a metaphysic question, but this time about the fundamental ontology. How do you think about, how do you think about the relation between uh, the mathematical Hilbert space and, and and the physical uh, uh, space, right? Uh, are you leaning towards some kind of configuration space realism, thinking that there is some uh, physical structures that look like the mathematical configuration um, Hilbert space? Or how does it look like if you have some idea about that? Yeah, so my idea, and again, you know, it may or may not work out at the end of the day, but my idea is that space in, in the sense of the three-dimensional space in which we live is way overrated. Uh, it, it is not fundamental. It is at best emergent. It's an approximate fit to a very, very different looking underlying quantum mechanical structure. And the fundamental ontology is a vector or maybe a density operator, if you want to be a little bit more technical, in a giant dimensional Hilbert space. The dimensionality of the Hilbert space that corresponds to our observable universe is something like 10 to the 10 to the 120 dimensions. So it's a big Hilbert space, but it's still finite in number. And there's a vector or a density operator in that Hilbert space that obeys an equation of motion. Um, and everything else is emergent from that. And there's no special role played for right. particle configurations or anything like that. Right. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm happy with that. But uh, then my question will be, do you think of the fundamental reality as being mathematical or physical? Right? Or no, do I you think... Yeah. I, I think of it as being physical, but I think of it as being, I think that reality is reality and we should let it be whatever it is. And I think that when I say, I will sometimes be sloppy and say, um, reality, the world, the universe is a vector in Hilbert space. But of course, I'm trusting the listener uh, well enough to know that what I mean is that a vector in Hilbert space provides a, an exact mathematical representation of reality. Okay, if I say a classical system is a point in phase space, I don't mean literally is a point in phase space. I mean, that gives me the information uh, that I need to exactly specify the ontology. Right, thanks. Sean, may I press a little bit more on, on this point? Because I think this is a delicate point. I mean, imagine, uh, I think people like uh, Max Tegmark would be happy to say, that uh, the world is literally a vector in uh, Hilbert space because uh, reality is mathematical. 
Uh, uh, now, I, I understand that you are not sympathetic with this kind of uh, ultra platonistic kind of uh, ideas. But if that's the case, um, what is it that makes uh, your ontology of uh, vectors of uh, uh, density matrices uh, physical uh, as opposed to mathematical? Because uh, just to give you a, a clearer idea of what I have in mind, when I say that my ontology is an ontology of material stuff uh, in space and time, I'm uh, clearly saying that uh, uh, there are things that makes this, these, uh, there are features that make this thing physical as opposed to um, merely mathematical. So the fact that uh, two objects are spatially related uh, following Leibniz uh, uh, is enough to, to distinguish those things uh, from some sort of mathematical construction. Now, my worry is that in your case, uh, there isn't uh, much to appeal to in order to say, hey, the thing that I call uh, vector in Hilbert space or density matrix is not a piece of mathematics, but it is a piece of physics. Um, do you see my worry here or uh, am I overthinking things as, uh, as philosophers often do? So I'm, I'm not completely sure. It's not just your worry. I've heard this you know, expressed before and it's, a, it's a, clearly a worry people have. Um, here's what I will guess as what I think is the right way to think about it. Um, I, I think that if it is true that the correct fundamental ontology of the world is accurately and completely represented by a vector in Hilbert space, um, that it makes no difference to talk about whether that whether reality is physical or mathematical. I think that the, we get the impression that that is a useful distinction from our experience in the manifest image where we live in the three-dimensional world and we have objects related in it. What I would like to say is that, that the world, the fundamental reality, is itself. It is unique. It is sui generis. It's not supposed to be anything else. I mean, we can't imagine, we can't, we can't presume to apply other everyday concepts to it in any special way. We can describe it. We can find features of it and describe them and find patterns within it and so forth. And that's the task of assigning it a mathematical representation and doing science and all that stuff. But to ask, but is it this or this? will always just be answered by, it is the universe. <laughs> and there's no better answer than that. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Alvaro, please ask your question. Thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is about the last part of the talk when you were speaking about how entanglement could be related with geometry. So I was thinking that in a theory of quantum gravity, geometry should be a variable of the theory and we could have like entanglement between different geometries and stuff so then if geometry is encoded in entanglement then it seems that there is i don't know if a redundancy or a contradiction in, in there can you say something about that no good you, you sort of you're you're putting a finger on something that i glossed over very quickly it was in one slide very very quickly but um in this whole game and, and it's not just me it's literally everyone who ever does quantum gravity there's constantly uh, sliding back and forth between the quantum language and the classical space-time language. So we talk about degrees of freedom and their location in space. But if you're doing quantum gravity, there's no such thing as the location in space, right? Uh, as you are correctly pointing out. But what there can be and what there needs to be to make sense of this whole program are branches of the wave function on which space-time looks semi-classical, okay? So there's the whole, and from the Everettian language, there's the whole shebang, which is the wave function of the universe, which as you say, describes a superposition of geometries. Uh, and when there's a superposition of geometries like that, there are no local observables. There's no such thing as the distance between two points in space or anything like that. But on a branch by branch basis, all of those things make sense. So that's why you know we need to imagine that 
it, not only are we in, working in this sort of weak field limit where the interactions are local, but we're also working for that second half of the talk in one branch of the wave function at a time where, where we have in fact uh, integrated out an environment, some you know, uh, gas of photons or whatever to give us some geometric description that really does look like a semi-classical geometry. And then we can talk about distances and stuff like that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an implicit cheat, but I think it's a justifiable cheat if I were being more careful and didn't try to fit too much stuff into a one hour talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there other first time questions? Carl, please go ahead. Yeah, I enjoyed the talk very much uh, also, but um, there was one little transition that left me puzzled and that's where you uh, were moving to supposing that uh, Hilbert space is finite dimensional and the justification had to do with the fact that we know if you get uh, infinite energy in a region, you get a black hole. And it just dialectically, it didn't seem right to invoke something that we know about black holes when the goal is to sort of get to, well, for two reasons. One is the goal is to get to Einstein's equations. And we only know that we get a black hole because we, we know Einstein's equations to begin with. But then also um, because one thing that a lot of physicists hope that quantum gravity will do for us is get rid of the <laughs> infinities in the black holes for us. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I hope that the dialectic is, is clear um, in the sense that the goal is ultimately to start with this very austere set of data, the eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian and maybe some in starting initial quantum state and derive everything in emerging wave from that. But the recipe for doing that, the, the development of the recipe is absolutely guided by things we know about the real world, right? Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have any reason to, set, to point out, the, to know that the real Hamiltonian of the real world is highly non-generic and lets us do these things like find a classical uh, limit, find local interactions, any of these things. It's very clear that at least in the part of the universe we can observe, uh, the dynamics are very special and non-generic and we are helping ourselves to knowing what that target is. We're not trying to build that in, but we're trying to use that knowledge to guide us. And so when we invoke black holes, what we're saying is, look, we, we at a starting point in this program, we need to decide whether the Hilbert spaces we care about are finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. So let's look at what we know about the real world. Oh, there's a good argument that in quantum gravity, the finite, the Hilbert space that describes a finite region of space will be finite dimensional. Okay, then we can forget about black holes and all that stuff and just say, let's look at finite dimensional Hilbert space. So we're, we're constantly going back and forth and using data from the real world in that sense. Um, to the point about black holes and, and um, singularities and worries like that, the only fact that we used about black holes is that they're maximum entropy states with a finite entropy. So I'm certainly not assuming anything about the actual structure of the interior of a black hole is given by Einstein's equation or anything like that. I mean, for all I know, firewalls might really be there. There might not be any in uh, interior of a black hole or Einstein's equations might be perfectly good. But all I care about is their finite dimensional Hilbert space subsystems of a bigger system. That's all I really need to use. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, other first time questions? Uh, otherwise, we can start the second round of questions. And I think that Lorenzo had another question. So Lorenzo, if you want to ask yeah, another I, I think there's one in the chat or not. There are two, but they are in the queue. <coughs> Don't worry about that. Okay, Hang okay, on. sorry, sorry. I didn't want to take away your one. So, so my, my second question was about, uh, I really like the connection between geometry and entanglement, but I'm, I'm a little confused about uh, one thing. I, I think you can, easily think that you can have two massively entangled systems and then you can separate them and put them as far apart as you want. So I'm not, it's not really clear how you can, if this is a counter example to, to what you're saying about the connection between entanglement and 
uh, and metric right and geometry so there are two answers to this uh, question um, one is very down to earth and readily believable the other is dramatic and speculative uh, the, the down to earth one is the following the entanglement we're talking about is really entanglement between vacuum degrees of freedom okay between degrees of freedom that are locally in their ground states and those just on the basics uh, basic dynamics of quantum field theory have a certain entanglement structure whenever you have particles whenever you have excitations over and above the vacuum uh, you're sort of breaking the entanglement between that degree of freedom and the vacuum state around it and it has now its own dynamics and particles can have whatever entanglement they want no matter how far away they want right mm -hmm. all that involves particles can be as entangled as you want and it's interesting you know just as a reality check you can I, I did this for a neutron star or for the sun you can ask in the total number of degrees of freedom in this spatial volume for a very dense object how many degrees of freedom are in their vacuum state? And the answer is almost all of them, even for a really, really dense object. So yes, from the quantum field theory point of view, even the center of the sun is almost a vacuum, okay? Um, the second and more dramatic thing is, of course, you could be Maldesena and Susskind, and you could say, well, maybe ER equals EPR, and there is secretly some kind of microscopic quantum wormhole connecting two entangled particles. And so maybe that's when you have particles that are entangled, it's just a breakdown of the idea that the space-time metric is smooth. It's not, it's not just the external metric, there's also sort of an internal non-traversable wormhole. And that I don't claim to understand, but maybe sure. there is some uh, compatibility there. No, no, no. No, no, but I buy your first your first okay. answers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Davide Romano has another question. Davide, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is more philosophical question. Uh, the idea of classicality that, that you have uh, in the project is a uh, subsystem at a certain point become classical, but the entire universe doesn't. Uh, I mean, um, classicality in this, in my way of thinking about it, um, is only supposed to be, you know, a, a phenomenon that appears on branches of the wave function. So um, if you, you know, if you're an Everettian and you're talking about Schrodinger's cat, the cat in a superposition state of awake and asleep is not classical, but it instantly decoheres and then you get two classical cats. Uh, and so that's what, what I want in my classical limit. I don't want my classical limit to apply to the wave function of the universe. When, I, when I'm looking for a classical limit, what I'm saying is I want there to be, number one, a factorization into systems and environment such that number two, there are pointer states in the system such that number three, those pointer states are well approximated by classical dynamics. So all of those things uh, are part of the package. Oh, okay, but just follow up uh, about this, uh, already this, the space, at least the space, you want the, the classical space for, for all universe. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I oh, absolutely no. believe that um, in the wave function of the universe or whatever you want to call it, um, there is a superposition of different classical geometries on different branches mm. of the wave function. For example, if you believe in vacuum decay, if you believe that there can be a false vacuum that decays by a bubble nucleation, the right way to think about that is there's a branch where the bubble has nucleated and there's a bubble that is growing of a different phase inside. And there's a branch where it has not nucleated just exactly as for a decaying nucleus. Um, and in those two branches, the space-time geometries are gonna be noticeably different. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we have two questions in the chat. Another one from Peter Morgan, so I'm going to read it. Uh, he uh, says, the algebraic structure of the last few slides looks very similar to the hag kassler axioms, but uh, with the Lorentz group omitted. Do you have an axiomatic construction? I, I was just being um, appropriately humble about the level of rigor that we reached. In the most recent paper with Charles Tsao, I did write down a list of um, things that you might call axioms, but are, it's really just a wish list for properties we want our theory to have, from which we can derive the conclusions we want to draw. Uh, but it's not, you know, it, it's, you know, Hogg would not be impressed by, <laughs> by our level of precision, but maybe that's something that could be aimed for. Oh.